The whole story began on a hot summer afternoon when I spotted an old computer sitting atop a pile of junk next to a house, waiting for its fate. I instantly recognized the type and knew it was something special, a Commodore pad. So I decided to save and restore it. Externally, it was in surprisingly good condition. No cracks or breaks, and all the keys were intact. Unfortunately, the inside told a different story. The components were in terrible shape, making it clear that a full restoration was out of question. I decided to restore the exterior and keyboard as much as possible, but replace the internal parts with modern components to make the machine functional again. If you're curious to see how this rusty piece of metal turned into a super retro computer, this video is for you. Let's start from the beginning. The machine is a CBM 832, a version of the Commodore PET computer. I won't go into its full history since many YouTube channels have already covered that. It's enough to say that the Commodore PET was the worst first all-in home computer. The original version came out in 1977 and mine is a model from 1980, but it's still a piece of computing history. Now let's see where we started. The keyboard and the exterior were very dirty, though that might not be so obvious in the pictures. Most of the keys were completely stuck and it was clear from the outside that the screws were heavily rusted. Here's one of the fastening screws, but the others were in no better condition. Despite all that, the frame of the machine was in really good shape. No cracks, no breaks, so I knew a good cleaning would yield great results. The keyboard looked fine from the outside, but I couldn't assess its true condition until I took it apart. After opening the computer, I unfortunately found very little inside worth saving. The power supply was completely rusted, as was the metal base of the frame. The motherboard was corroded in several places and various chemicals had leaked from many of the electronic components. While I don't have the footage of the monitor disassembly, you can see here the extent of rust and damage inside. Based on this, I decided to completely replace the power supply and monitor as well as its electronics as they were beyond repair. I plan to fully restore the keyboard and keep the original motherboard and the 6502 processor but mostly for aesthetic and historical reasons. Everything else would be clean and rebuilt. My plan was to use a Raspberry Pi running an emulator with the original keyboard connected via a USB adapter and a new LCD panel to replace the old monitor. My goal was to have a modern computer that's still fully providing the original user experience. I know the machine won't be original, but I believe it will be more reliable. And unlike the 40-year-old electronics, it won't break down anytime soon. The first challenge was disassembling the machine. Some screws were so rusted that they couldn't be unscrewed with a screwdriver. These often had to be broken off, like this screw that held the monitor's electronics. Despite this, I managed to take the computer apart in about an hour. Afterwards, I cleaned everything using water and paper towels. Here you can see some screws I managed to save Though, unfortunately, most will need to be replaced. Aside from the rusted frame of the computer and the lower part of the case, the housing was in a pretty good shape after the first cleaning. Even the motherboard had a few rounds in the dishwasher and without the thick layer of dust, it was starting to look much better. After removing the monitor's frame, more rust spots appeared. There's still a lot scrubbing to do. Now that all parts are separated, the real cleaning can begin. I first treated the metal frame with a wire brush, then soaked it in vinegar in a plastic container. It will stay there for one or two days and I will rotate it periodically to remove as much rust as possible. I also started cleaning the lower section with a wire brush, though fortunately the situation wasn't as severe there. The plastic parts went into the bath when I scrubbed them thoroughly with baking soda. This was the most exhausting part of the project. It took me 3-4 hours to clean all the parts, but I was really satisfied with the result. Only a few faint spots remained, the rest looked great. Here's the monitor frame. It's not perfect, but 95% of the rust is gone, and since the lower part will be repainted, it won't be an eyesore. 
The plastic parts also came out nice and clean. Since I am not familiar with painting, especially spray painting, I decided to use animal paint typically used in modeling and applying it with a brush. I choose a glossy bag for the lower section and a matte white for the monitor's frame slower part. Here you can see, I masked off the areas I didn't want to paint with the tape, then slowly and evenly applied three coats of white paint. I only needed to apply one coat of the black paint as there were only minor spots to fix. By the next morning the final result was done and I think it turned out quite well. In this picture you can see that the difference from the original color is barely noticeable when everything is assembled. Meanwhile the first of many packages arrived. I need to replace many screws but now I've got enough to do the job. The most exciting and also most labor intensive part was restoring the keyboard. At some point the entire keyboard had been covered in aluminum foil which you can still see on the edges of the frame here. I had to remove it from everywhere. Afterward I had to individually remove each key using a special key puller. You can already see the amount of grime that had accumulated over the years. I collected the springs and keys in separate containers. The shift lock mechanism has a unique design. After removing the keys, the dirt, built up over the years, became really apparent. Now I had to unscrew almost 20 tiny screws to separate the upper part of the keyboard from the electronic board. And here comes the big moment, I'll find out how badly the electronics are damaged and whether the keyboard can be saved. At first glance, it looks I'll be lucky, though there are one two nasty corrosion spots and the rest of aluminium foil are still stuck in many places. After a quick alcohol cleaning, the conductive traces seem undamaged. I double checked everything with my multimeter to ensure continuity and thankfully everything works perfectly. I thoroughly cleaned the electronics with alcohol and contact spray and now it looks as good as new. I stored each of the small plungers and keys separately to clean them later. The contact parts of the plungers will need to be replaced. I put all these parts in plastic bags to ensure nothing gets lost. Here you can see how the vinegar is cleaning the screws. Now I scrub all parts with toothbrush, window cleaner and wipe. You can probably tell how tedious this process is. I'll show you a close-up of the dirt layer covering the keys and how they look after cleaning. Meanwhile, I thoroughly cleaned the upper part of the keyboard and the remaining aluminum foil is now gone. Now on to the most critical part. These tiny contacts work similarly to those in the TV remote control. The black part conducts electricity, completing the circuit when the key is pressed. Unfortunately, these contacts have worn out over the last 40 years. There are several ways to repair them. I'm cutting small pieces of aluminum foil with a hole punch and gluing them in place with a gel superglue. I have to repair 73 keys in total and I thoroughly clean each small rubber part with alcohol. This process takes hours, but eventually every key is done. Before reassembling the keyboard, I tested the electronics with this special tool I made for this purpose. I cleaned any stubborn spots with alcohol and contact spray until everything worked perfectly. Finally, all springs and keys went back into place. I watched many similar videos, but this part was very enjoyable. Another package arrived the USB adapter from England. With this little device I can use the Commodore Pad keyboard as a USB keyboard. I plugged it in and since the Raspberry Pi hasn't arrived yet, I tested the keyboard on my laptop. At this moment I felt a huge sense of relief, as this was one of the project's most important aspects. I really wanted to save the original keyboard and it seems everything works fine. 
While waiting for the Raspberry Pi, I prepared the emulator. I'm using a BMC64 and BMPAT beer machine emulator. It's basically a wise based emulator that can boot directly on the Raspberry, bypassing the operating system. This means, when you turn on the Raspberry, the emulator starts automatically, providing an authentic experience and it's faster since you don't have to start the emulator separately. Installation and setup were relatively simple. Download an image file, write it to an SD card using the Raspberry Pi imager, then copy the appropriate files into the right folders, editing the config files and maybe adding some sloppy images if needed. Finally, the Raspberry arrived. The emulator supports the Raspberry 2 and 3. I choose the Raspberry 3. The emulator booted up immediately. By default, it opens in C64 mode, but after configuring it, now it boots directly into the pet mode. I am thrilled to say that the keyboard layout is almost perfect. While it could be reconfigured within the emulator, I've decided to stick with the default settings. Everything works wonderfully, with one small exception. The emulator is clearly optimized for the Commodore 64, and to open the menu, it uses the Commodore plus F7 key combination. This works fine on the Commodore 64, but unfortunately the pet keyboard lacks these keys. Since I couldn't find an option in the documentation to remap the menu function to another key combination, I had to come up with a different solution. Luckily, there's an option to use the Raspberry Pi's GPIO ports, so I assigned the menu function to pin 21. Later, I will add the switch for easier access, but for now, I'll continue testing. Finally, the last piece of the puzzle arrives, the monitor. I managed to find a 12-inch 4 to 3 aspect ratio LCD monitor at a reasonable price. The resolution is very low at 800 by 600 pixels, but it's perfect for my project. According to the product description, it's a bit wider than the frame it needs to fit into, but I hope the actual LCD panel itself will be the right size. And here comes the next package, some additional screws for the assembly. I quickly open the frame and immediately see that the LCD panel is a perfect fit. Moreover, it's a sharp panel, so it should be of relatively good quality. The panel is held in place with hot glue, as you can see here. It's a cheap solution, but relatively easy to remove. Here you can see me freeing the tiny speaker from the glue, and after 10-15 minutes I managed to separate the frame and the panel. There are some minor aesthetic repairs needed, but nothing that can be fixed. Now I can finally test the full setup for the first time. It becomes clear that the emulator isn't plug and play. Each peripheral, including the monitor, must be powered on separately, otherwise the emulator won't recognize it. This means the monitor must always be turned on first. It's slightly different from the original experience, but I can complain about the picture quality. It's exactly what I hope for. A few more items for my menu switch are on the way, along with a small plastic case for the Raspberry Pi. And after about a month of preparation, everything is ready for the final assembly. First, I mount the monitor frame to the top part of the case. I place a paper pad cut to size under the frame to protect the plastic from further discoloration as some rust might still be present at the base of the frame. After this, I remove the top section and place the original motherboard in its spot. This is purely for aesthetics, but I think it looks very cool and holding the 6502 processor is a truly great feeling, even if it won't be functional for now. The power strip will be installed in place of the power supply, but for now I'm just figuring out the best placement. Next, the LCD panel is mounted. It's supported underneath by a hard plastic foam layer with wooden rulers, which I bought from the paper shop, used as braces above and below. It might not be the most professional solution, but it works perfectly, ensuring the panel is secured in all directions. 
I secured the electronics and wires to the frame using plastic zip ties where possible and attached the controller board with a double-sided tape. And since the ruler solution worked well before, I attached the speakers to a smaller ruler and fastened them to the frame as well. From every angle the LCD panel fits almost perfectly. Of course, the frame was designed for a CRT screen, but since I used a black marker to touch up the edges of the monitor, the size difference will be hardly noticeable. And this was the most time-consuming part of the build. Routing all the wires took around 3 hours, but finally the back panel is secured with nice new screws. Now I reassembled the button and the top sections of the case and the keyboard goes back to place. It's held by 12 screws. For now I only fasten it with 2 screws so I can quickly test it with the Raspberry Pi. The monitor powers on, then the emulator, and the keyboard works, everything is perfect. Finally, the reset button is installed. As you can see, the button fits perfectly into the small hole on the pad's frame. I'm not sure what the original function of the hole was, but the size is perfect. Inside there is space for the monitor's remote, and of course, no Commodore project is complete without a user manual. This is a scanned version of the original Commodore BASIC manual which I printed and bound. I'll use it to look up BASIC commands when I'm programming. And here's the final internal layout. There's the new power supply, the Raspberry Pi with the reset button, the USB adapter attached to the daughter board, and an extended USB port for easy access to load floppy disk images. And now for the final reveal. Since I couldn't find many demo programs for the 80 column pad, I wrote one myself to demonstrate the machine's excellent graphical capabilities. Here the emulator menu opens, I select the floppy from the USB drive, load, then list, load, run, and here it is, the brand new Raspberry Pad. I show it from different angles. I couldn't be happier with the outcomes of this project. I'm especially pleased that I managed to restore the keyboard and the new monitor looks fantastic. I'm also very happy that I kept the original board and CPU. This gives me the illusion that the machine still has its old soul, even if replaced with newer parts. Using the machine provides a truly authentic experience, but with modern parts it won't break down anytime soon. Finally, I hope you learned something new, or at least you enjoyed watching this restoration project. See you next time and thanks for watching.